Welcome to the podcast for STEM Biology, Chapter 4, which is on the cell. First thing we're going to do is talk about the history of the cell. Um, there are certain scientists that you need to know their name and what they are famous for. Um, the first one is Robert Hooke. He actually came up with the word cell. He was the first one to see the cell under the microscope. He was looking at um, a plant cell, um, actually, and that was the picture he drew or cork of the plant and um, and so he saw these little squares and he said those look like my cell because he was a, a monk and he lived in a monastery and his rooms were really small and so that's where the word cell came from. The next scientist is Leeuwenhoek, Anton Leeuwenhoek and he is famous for two different discoveries. He discovered that all bacteria are composed of cells and he was a glass maker, a very good glass maker back then and he invented the, very, the first good microscope that worked well. There were other microscopes before him. They weren't as good. Um, this was a handheld microscope that had a lens right here. And it, because of that lens, they were able to magnify the image very well. Third scientist is uh, Schleiden. He discovered that all plants are made of cells. Schwann, he discovered that all animals are made of cells. And Virchow is the last one, and he discovered that cells can only come from existing cells. So you got five scientists to know. Robert Hooke, Leeuwenhoek, Schleiden, Schwann, and Virchow. Okay? Um, with the last three, they actually lived at the same time and in the same area, and they came up with the cell theory. Um, you should be familiar with the steps for the cell theory. Step number one. All living things are composed of cells. Cells are the basic units of structure for a living organism and they provide function. Cells are the basic units of structure and function. And number three, cells are produced only from other living cells. So these three parts are to the cell theory and the scientists that observed that, that worked together on this, was Schleiden, Schwann, and Virchow. Okay, there are two different types of cells, prokaryotic cells and eukaryotic cells. Um, prokaryotic cells we're actually going to learn in our next chapter because these are our bacteria cells. These cells lived a long time ago. They're the oldest cells around. They lived at least 4.6 billion years ago. They are single-celled. That means they are unicellular, which means they are only one cell big. And they do not have a nucleus. That's what you need to remember right there. They lack a nucleus. They don't, so they don't have a nuclear membrane around the nucleus, and they don't have any organelles. There's no mitochondria, there's no ER, there's no lysosome, nothing in there. Um, the genetic material, they do have DNA um, but, or RNA, um, but they do not have a membrane around it. It's just floating inside the cell in the, in the cytoplasm. Bacteria or prokaryotic cells are very small. Okay. Um, when we see them under the microscope, you will have to go to the highest, one of the highest powers to and able to observe them. Okay, the other type of cell are eukaryotic cells. Eukaryotic cells are the cells that you, you've heard of before, you've seen the structures of before. These cells have a nucleus and organelles. Okay, um, an organelle is basically a mini organ that all work together for the cell. Um, our genetic, because I'm saying our because we are made of eukaryotic cells, our genetic material, meaning our DNA, has a membrane around it. It's called the nuclear membrane. It's not just floating around in the cytoplasm. Um, eukaryotic cells are not as old as prokaryotic cells. Um, eukaryotic cells can be unicellular or multicellular, which means they can be more than one cell and compose of tissues in um, higher animals. Um, eukaryotic cells are found in plants in animals, in fungi, and in our protists. Okay. Um, the next thing we're going to talk about are the size of cells. Cells are very small. We saw that on our diagram last podcast with the microscope. Um, cells have to be small. Okay. There's materials that the cell needs, and the cell needs to get that materials in an efficient manner. So these needed materials must be able to be transported inside the cell quickly. Um, also, on the opposite side of that, there's waste that the cell has, okay? Just like our body, there's waste. You have to get rid of it. Waste materials need to be able to get out of the cell in an efficient manner. 
So the smaller the cell, the better. Um, smaller cells are more efficient because they have a better surface area to volume ratio. If you calculate the surface area for small cells and big cells, and you calculate the volume for small cells and big cells, and you compare that ratio, you will see that smaller cells have a higher or a smaller surface area to volume ratio. We will be doing this in class, so you'll see what I'm talking about. Okay, so let's go through the different organelles. Um, the first one is the cell membrane. It's also called the plasma membrane. And so if you want to make a little chart in your notes, that would be good because these are the components that you need to know for each of the organelles. So you need to know the name of the organelle. You need to know if it's in a plant cell, an animal cell, or is it in both. What it looks like. Okay, and so I'm going to give you a, a, you know, a picture of this. And um, what its job is. What's its function in the cell. So the first one we're doing is the plasma membrane or the cell membrane. It is found in both plants and animals, and we learned about this last chapter. It is made of a lipid bilayer. You have your polar heads here. Those are the circles, and that is your phosphate group, your um, choline group, and then you have your nonpolar tails. These are your fatty acids. There's two of them per polar head, as you can see in the picture, and those are nonpolar, so those are hydrophobic. The polar part is hydrophilic, and that is called the phospholipid bilayer. Um, its job in the cell is to allow materials in and out of the cell. Cell membranes are semi-permeable or selectively permeable. They will allow things in or out of the cell as they wish. We will talk more about these proteins um, in our uh, next chapter. All right, next organelle is the rough ER or endoplasmic reticulum. Because it is rough, um, there's a smooth one as well. You can abbreviate the, the rough ER as RER on any notes or worksheets or tests. It is found in both plants and animal cells. And as you can see from the diagram, it is always next to the nucleus. Okay, it's connected to the nucleus by the membrane. And because it is rough, it contains ribosomes. And ribosomes are these small little dots here that are attached to the rough ER. And it's kind of like a tunnel system. That's what it looks like. Okay. And what it does is it takes the protein and it transports the protein to the Golgi body or the Golgi apparatus. And it does that basically by taking the protein and pushing it to these vesicles. Vesicles are just small little taxi cabs kind of thing. And the vesicles will take that protein to the Golgi body. Okay. So that is the rough ER. The next one is the smooth ER. You can abbreviate that as SER. Here's the rough ER, here's your nucleus, here's your rough, and then notice the smooth ER is a little bit different looking. It's tubular, it's not as stacked, you know, flat um, tunnels like. Okay, it is found in plants and animals. So it's more tubular and it's smooth, which means it does not have any ribosomes like the rough ER does. Okay, smooth, no ribosomes, and it also is connected by the membranes to the rough ER and the nucleus. And its job is to make lipids. So it is constantly doing condensation reactions and putting these fatty acids together to make our, the fat in our body, the lipids. Okay, the next one I mentioned was a vesicle. Vesicles are those little taxi cabs that I just mentioned that go between the ER and the Golgi body. Okay. So it, they carry the protein from the RER to the Golgi body or Golgi apparatus. Um, it is in both plants and animal cells. You can see it right here. It's just a small little circular sac-like organelle. The next one is a ribosome. Ribosomes can be found in two different areas. They can be bound to the rough ER, as we just discussed, or they can be just these dots here. They can just be free in the cytoplasm. So they look like small dots, they're easily to, to see, and their job is to make the protein. So they are doing condensation reactions, putting the amino acids together to make protein. The next organelle is the nucleus. This whole thing is the nucleus. It does have an outer membrane and an inner membrane. So there's actually two membranes to a nucleus. Um, there is fluid-like material that's called nucleoplasm in the center of a nucleus. The middle part of a nucleus is the nucleolus, 
and then you have chromosomes or chromatin in there. And on the outer membrane, or the nuclear membrane, you have holes. They're called pores, nuclear pores, and those allow things to get in or out of the nucleus. Um, the nuclear membrane is also called the nuclear envelope. Both plant and animal cells both have a nucleus. However, prokaryotic cells, remember, do not. So they look like a large, and they're usually in the middle of the cell. They have a membrane, and they contain chromosomes and the nucleus in there. And its job is to control the cell. They basically overtake the cell and make sure everything is working properly. Um, on the side note, you have the next organelle would be the nuclear envelope or the nuclear membrane. Again, both plants and animal cells have it, not prokaryotic cells. It surrounds the nucleus, and it allows RNA and protein in and out of the nucleus through the nuclear pores. Next organelle is the nucleolus. It's in the center of your nucleus. Um, it is both plant and animal cells, but not prokaryotic cells. And its job is to make ribosomes. So this is where your ribosomes are made. Okay, let's talk about the chromosome. The chromosomes are found inside the nucleus. And they can look like different, different shapes, um, and you'll get more into this in your biology in the second trimester. Um, they can look like a ball of yarn inside the nucleus. They can look like little lines, like, or like X's, okay? And these little bands on here are the, representing the genes that you would find on um, a chromosome. And that's what its job is, is to take these genes and make sure that they're on the chromosome for the next offspring. So these are called chromosomes. They're also going to be called chromatin or chromatids. Again, you get more into that detail in um, second trimester. Both plants and animal cells have chromosomes. And we're going to stop here and continue on with podcast 4.2.